cool. And so this isn't like a formal presentation or anything. I um, have put some slides together just to like get the conversation going, but really I wanna hear from you guys um, about what you think we did this year that was most impactful. What do you wanna see more of next year? Um, and how we can get ultimately more people involved in all of this and what we're doing. Um, because we do really think that once we get the veterinary profession on board with animal rights and animal protection, we will make really great strides in change for animals, legislatively, um, in court, in policy, in so many different ways. Oh, hey, B, awesome. Glad to see you here. Hi, glad to be here. Um, got it. Let me just take you to our next slide here. Oops, this first slide, it's a little sticky, is kind of just how it all started. Um, basically, I was starting to post more things about animal rights um, and, and questioning things like terminal surgeries. And then this meme goes out about me on all of the veterinary Facebook groups saying, beware, saying beware. beware. Nothing good for our profession. Why do I hear a, an echo? Can somebody, I'm gonna mute everybody um, so that there's not an echo, but yeah. And this other veterinarian wrote this horrible post underneath one of my um, posts saying that I, I'm a deranged activist and I lie and all of these things. and. Ultimately, this thread was shut down, so I couldn't defend myself, and I was kicked out of all of these Facebook groups. Um, but they were saying that I was affiliated with the ALF and the ELF, which I had not done any of that. They were saying I was going to go undercover and secretly record people, which I've never done anything like that. I merely worked in legislation, and I thought, wow, this is really nuts how they're doing this to me. Um, and then some of my colleagues reached out and said, oh, they had the same thing happen to them. And then we found the uh, Freedom of Information Act um, requests of the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service that this was a coordinated campaign by members of the Pork Board and the Animal Ag Alliance to really discredit me and smear me um, because I was a danger just questioning some of their practices. And this kind of coincided with the um, investigation of ventilation shutdown, where they, during COVID-19, sealed up barns, pumped in heat and steam, and waited for the pigs inside to die. Um, and a lot of these documents also showed their conversations around that. And recently, we have gotten even more documents. Um, and this is story a story from now it's three years later, this story was published in January of 2023, um, kind of highlighting the ongoing battle we have had trying to get the American Veterinary Medical Association to reclassify mass killing of animals via heat stroke as not recommended. And we thought it was a pretty easy ask. I mean, this, this is a horrifying thing. It was never meant to be used in this way. It was just kind of used as a cost-saving way to get rid of animals when producers had failed to plan uh, for some sort of slaughterhouse shutdown. Um, and since then, it's been three years later, they have still failed to put plans in place to use better methods and, oh, I do want to introduce our new board member pretty soon, um, but but yeah, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. And we've, we've uncovered some more documents and a new big story will be coming out in the next few weeks about all of that. Um, so it's really exciting stuff. I mean, really exciting, really sad and disturbing too. Um, but yeah, I just want to introduce our new board member, um, Dr. Cork Ketak. Um, she I, is that how you say your last name? I've never really asked, but um, we are tax totally fine. <laughs> so glad to have her on our board. Um, uh, she has she's a graduate of University of Illinois 
a College of Veterinary Medicine in 2020. Um, she took a philosophy course on animal rights and animal welfare issues. And that kind of spurred her enthusiasm for the cause. And she has volunteered at the New York City shelters and the ASBCA. Um, and she was on the board of the HSVMA Illinois student chapter and the Shelter Medicine Club. So we are super happy to have her on our board now. Um, and we just got back from the Animal Law Conference where I met B. Um, so, and this kind of inspired some brainstorming about what we can do because we met a lot of law students and we saw in the legal profession, the conversation around animal rights and animal personhood where it's it's not really where it should be, but it's so much farther along than it is in the veterinary profession. When veterinary students are afraid to admit that they're even vegan or they can't even have conversations about animal rights in their classes. And they're even early on in their courses, they are indoctrinated into this belief that veterinarians are all about animal welfare and animal rights is a foolish perspective. And the even the field of animal law, I remember this from my vet school, the field of animal law was a danger to our profession. And here, just it's so great to talk to all of these students who are just so used to these conversations about animal rights and where it's headed and animal personhood is a real possibility. Um, so I got to thinking, how can we bring the animal law students and the veterinary students together and hopefully help debunk some of the myths that vet students are taught about animal law and animal rights and give them a more nuanced perspective on this whole thing and also support those vet students who are supportive of animal rights, who are vegan, who are wanting to make real changes for animals and who are still stuck in going to school and forced to participate in a curriculum that causes harm to animals. Um, so we have HSVMA chapters in vet schools. We have student ALDF chapters at law schools. Many of these law schools also have vet schools. It's like, we need to get these two groups together. So that's kind of what we hope to do and when you think of how, um, how, what, what we have to battle when, when changing AVMA policy, something like ventilation shutdown, when you really look at the numbers of who are, who are veterinarians, like what are their beliefs? What do they, um, who do they treat? Only a small number here, like, 5% are food animal veterinarians. And I guarantee you a lot of these food animal veterinarians are also on our side. Like they don't want ventilation shut down. When I was, when I, you know, when I do shelter medicine, I kind of view my job as um, hoping to one day end the need for, for shelter veterinarians in the future because all animals have homes. And I would think that food animal veterinarians would have the same perspective. They would not, they would want to create a world where their job is obsolete, where there will be no future food animal veterinarians because we've had transitioned to a slaughter free form of food production. Um, and that's, I think what we have to ultimately attain. And I'm just, Rihanna just sent me this newsletter where it shows all of these scholarships for uh, veterinary students who are going into swine medicine. And it's like, we need to push back. And so this is where our honor, we created our own scholarship to help support uh, vet students who are supportive of animal rights um, to sort of normalize this concept and get it into these really ag heavy schools like Iowa State University. So all of the, our submissions are in for this scholarship and we're right now kind of gr grading and scoring the submissions and we'll come to a decision about who wins um, each of these scholarships shortly. Um, and we went to the AVA summit, but before, let me see if I can get this whole polling thing work 
I've never done this before. So, oh no, like since I logged into another device, my polling session is inactive. That sucks. Um, I wonder if there's some way I can do this over here. Do, 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 do. So yeah, it, it, does anybody have any comments or questions on what I've presented so far? I hope I can um, get my polling thing to work. That will really be too bad if I can't. Hmm. Okay, well, let me go to my polling questions. Um, even if I can't get it to pop up, maybe I can just read them. But I wanna hear from you. What do you think um, has been the most impactful thing that we have done this year? I mean, we've, oh, here we go. Somebody, did do you all see that? this poll? I can see it. Yes. Cool. Um, so feel, what has been our most impactful work this year? Um, was it supporting activists demonstrating at the ABMA convention? And this was done, um, we were raising awareness about the slaughterhouse gas chambers, the pig slaughterhouse gas chambers. Um, and we, so, yeah, uh, getting banned from the AVMA Humane Endings Symposium, that was a shock to, to get banned from that. Um, supporting veterinary students and supporting veterinarians, informing our community via um, our newsletter about news and research um, that's ongoing, debunking animal ag propaganda and normalizing animal rights. And you can answer, you know, more than one of these um, at a time, um, creating animal rights protection and race approved, race approved continuing education courses, um, publishing um, an article debunking um, the anti declaw propaganda um, that was put forth by the state VMAs in Chicago Policy Review, our podcast appearances, um, our scholarships for animal rights students, um, connecting in person with everybody at conferences like this, the AVA Summit, creating our stylish merchandise that normalizes animal rights, um, uncovering AVMA and pork board and uh, VSD information via FOIA documents, our vegan veterinarian chats that were put on by Dr. Daniela Castillo, um, which I definitely want to do some more of. Um, our executive summary that was submitted to the AVMA House of Delegates, and we got a bunch of veterinarians to submit it to their delegates, and everybody saw that. And then Dr. Martha Smith Blackmore took to the, the stage and said, the elephant in the room is animal agriculture. Um, and she shared it with her working group. Um, and our petition opposing the EATS Act. Um, and there's also that op-ed that I wrote in Modern Farmer about the EATS Act, getting veterinarians to sign a statement saying that pig slaughterhouse gas chambers are a violation of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, encouraging veterinarians to speak at various city council and board of supervisor meetings. And this is where we got wild cow milking banned in Alameda. And we also stopped Science Corp from expanding. And we went and taught, spoke at the University of Wisconsin, University of Chicago Law School, and Michigan State University Law School, talking about veterinarians and animal rights and collaborating with um, animal attorneys and our support for bans on decline and many other things. And then what would you like to see more of um, next year? Please tell us um, your answers to that. Feel free to take your time and go through that. Um, and yeah, 
I don't know if Caleb, if you're able to share the results in any way, I'm not sure how this works. Yeah, so I can see so far we've got um, 63% of people saying um, supporting veterinary students was the most impactful. And then behind that, we've got supporting activists demonstrating at the AVMA convention, debunking animal ag propaganda via social media, creating race-approved continuing education courses. And then just behind that, we've got publishing the Chicago Policy Review article, debunking state BMA anti-declaw propaganda and getting banned from the Humane Ending Symposium. Yay, that sounds awesome. It's the vegan veterinarian chats as well. And right now, what we've got for, what would you like to see more of next year? Overwhelming animal rescues. And then... <laughs> Okay. Protests, um, gatherings, reviews of vet classes, and more articles in the mainstream press. Yeah, more articles. Yeah, animal rescues. Like, hmm. I, I kind of put it there just to see. But, you know, one thing that's really interesting, all of the really great veterinarians that I've ever talked to, um, they've all rescued animals in vet school. <laughs> They all like, I just think of like Holly Cheever rescued a pony um, when she was in vet school. I mean, I didn't do like a crazy rescue, but there was a cat that was abandoned at UC Davis um, vet school for skin condition and I adopted her. And then there was this little chihuahua that whose people let out and let run around the school and we spent days trying to capture that little chihuahua but nothing like you know rescuing an animal under cover of darkness <laughs> sort of thing but that has been done by quite a few veterinarians um, and students in general rescuing uh, animals from their classes so can't officially encourage that unless I speak to a lawyer first but very supportive in general um no and, and as a lawyer i have to tell you don't do anything illegal yeah, don't do anything illegal but from, <laughs> from what i understand it's not always illegal so i don't know talk to your lawyer <laughs> talk to your friendly right talk to um so yeah um the next poll i want to put forth is veterinary school changes. Caleb, can you bring that one up? Um, what would you like to change about veterinary school? Just kind of short answer, take a few minutes to give us your thoughts. All right, are we seeing any responses, Caleb? Therefore, we've got two, uh, three. I think people are still finishing up. maybe 20 more seconds and then I'll share the results. Well,
Okay. Okay. So I, I'm trying to figure out how to read this. All right. So I hear um, expose the agriculture professors on the admissions committee for bias against vegans. Yes. Um, I'm not a vet, but I can say there should be more emphasis on animal rights. That is for sure. It should not be a perspective that's instantly dismissed uh, like it is. The way some teachers refer to animals as things. Yes, we need to like stop that referring to them as it instead of he, she, they. Ending terminal surgeries, 100%. It's outrageous that we still have that happening in vet schools in great numbers. And it's not even just terminal surgeries. I was just reviewing some FOIA documents today where a vet school purchases animals from a company to kill for their anatomy labs. Um, when there could be like willed body programs, when there's plenty of animals who die of natural causes or need to be euthanized for health reasons, whose bodies could be donated, but no, to like purposefully breed and kill animals for this is absolutely outrageous. And then make food animal courses optional, less of a focus on reproduction, better representation of animal rights views and animal ethics and welfare courses. Yeah, hundred percent. Although I don't, I kind of think regarding like making food animal courses optional, I wonder if it could be presented in a way of like, as long as this is ongoing, like you must, I don't know, like you must know about this and you must be horrified. Like that's how it should be presented is like kind of the way I imagine like human doctors might discuss um, certain barbaric practices that we do on humans, like um, capital punishment or um, people who are trafficked for various reasons. Um, as long as that's happening, it needs to be like highlighted and kind of a discussion of like, well, how can we stop this? Like, how can we scale it down? Um, that should be a psych evaluation pre-veterinary school. I agree. And I always wondered like how many veterinarians are psychopaths because I, I know the vast majority are compassionate people who get into the field because they love animals. But there's always like the Jeffrey Dahmer types who like really like cutting into animals and stuff. And you always wonder how many are like that and is if there's like a psychologist who's can do some sort of survey of that so we could try to figure that out like what percentage are is that are those people I would be really curious um and there's a, a big portion of people to go in caring about animals and loving animals but then they're just normalized to the violence and they're taught this belief that animals are here for us to use and animal rights is a foolish perspective and it's otherwise good people who are susceptible to the pressures to cause harm ultimately are ones who end up supporting and legitimizing things like a ventilation shutdown. Um, but yeah, any thoughts on that? I'd love to hear from you all. What can we do to address veterinary schools? And would you guys be willing to volunteer time to do this, to engage with the students? Let's see what we got next. I think um, before we move on, um, I think one thing that really interests me and I think would interest a lot of students is like in-person live debates about animal rights with food animal people. Um, it's tricky, like, would they let us do it? Would how, Could we get in there? Um, and I think we might if we go in through like the HSVMA chapters, like all of these students groups have these lunch talks and stuff. If they could arrange a lunch talk where 
I come in and somebody else who's really good at debating um, about animal rights with people who are, you know, food animal veterinarians, um, I think it would be really interesting and help give the students the language to fight back against what they're taught. Um, you say, yeah, I'd be, Joanne says, I'd be happy to talk to students in need. Um, Shady says, I would love to do the same thing as you are doing for students in my country, yes. And we, uh, Isabel put on that, um, you're in Ecuador, right? But Isabel Tancioni put on this big series in Brazil for Brazilian students that I spoke at and we kind of attacked animal rights from all different angles and it was for veterinarians and veterinary students. So maybe you could do something like that, um, get put on a series, get guest speakers. Uh, and then she dubbed it over in um, Portuguese or did Portuguese subtitles. And I know now with AI, um, there's a program called Hey Gen, where you can just talk like I'm talking now, but it will then dub you over in whatever language you want. And it sounds like you are speaking that language, even like with an, like if I was speaking in Portuguese, it'd be like I was speaking in Portuguese, but with an American accent. And it's like very cool. Like you can't tell. Um, so. Um, yeah, and Joanne says, be happy to talk to students um, in need. Katie says, yes, so much about the idea that we're normalized to this in vet school. Farm animals are here for us to use. More talks of vegan vets in Spanish. Yes. Um, I want Daniela to do that too. Um, if we could get her to do her vegan vet talks, but just all in Spanish, that would be amazing. Kim says, there should be at least an alternative oath that vet schools accepted. We tried to get the alternate oath approved for graduation for our small group, but our dean said no. Um, yeah, it's called a page, I think. Um, yeah, we were always discussing that alternate oath idea too. And I almost think like UC Davis might be the best school to try this at because we have a lot of people, professors at UC Davis, instructors who are very supportive of us, um, who might, if we wrote something really good, we could be like, okay, UC Davis, you're going to be the first class and you're going to have the option of saying this alternate oath before you begin and seeing if they would be down to do that. Um, so yeah, just if you want to help with that, like please um, reach out. I think the alternate oath idea is a great one and we've drafted some, um, but that's something we have to get the ball rolling on too. And I think we have to start having these conversations in the schools themselves, like in person, doing the lunch talks in the schools. Um, and it takes a lot, like I need, the students there to help organize this because I can't as an outsider get in there to do this myself. So let's talk about um, sort of meeting frequency. I guess let's do that poll. I don't know if you can do that, Caleb. Open that one up um, to see what you guys are thinking. What is your level of commitment? Could you meet with us on a regular basis to advance these sorts of things. And Melissa says, how do we get past the ag heavy deans and instructors? Well, we have to have either students who are willing to host talks. Um, we could even bait them like, oh, you, you wanna debate these crazy animal rights activists. Um, I think a lot of them are down because they've never had to engage with somebody who's actually good at debating in these sorts of forums. And I, I'm not saying I am, but I know some people who are. Like I could, I am not the person who goes in there and is like, I will do battle with you. I just merely add the sparkle to 
whatever is being done. <laughs> I am not the hardcore fighter by any means. Um, I just am a little dash of spice here and there. Can I just add something as far as like bringing a non vet in like a lawyer into vet schools? Cause yeah. that could, you know, cause I don't know, like as a veterinarian, I'm definitely not trained to debate or I don't have the slightest idea of where to start. And there's definitely like, I'm intimidated by the whole thing in general, yet I have such strong feelings about this, you know, animal rights. Um, but when you have like a lawyer, that's kind of takes a step back for these deans and instructors that are, you know, um, all about ag. So, yeah. And I know what kind of started me on thinking about this is I know a, an attorney who's a quite famous TikToker um, for other reasons, who is a very good debater and she's vegan and um she I'm like oh my god we need to go and do this like have this discussion debate in veterinary schools um with the ag professors um because she would be so good so I'm excited about it we're, we're gonna try to work on it maybe at UC Davis first and then take the show on the road to anybody who will have us um I think we just, you know, record a couple of these things, um, get good at it. Um, but other attorneys too, I'm sure there's lots. I think the problem with us as vets is I know in me, I'm very quiet and I don't like to do public speaking or anything. And I'm here because I feel like I hate animal agriculture more than I hate public speaking. So that's why I'm doing this. Um, but I'd rather not, I'd rather just sit and write stuff. Um, so, so yeah. Um, Caleb, I don't know if you were able to get that pull up of like frequency, meeting frequency. Oh, for sure. And we can all kind of decide how often are you willing to join our honor and strategize these sorts of things? Yeah, and get your friends. Um, so the poll is up. If you could do the poll poll. Let's see. Do. Oh, cool. Once a quarter, once a month, every other week, once a week. Cool. Maybe like the, for the really engaged people, if there's enough, we could do a once a week thing. I think we got to do things once a week in order to like get the ball rolling, but meetings shouldn't be pointless. Sometimes we only need a little brief check-in, like how are you pro progressing on this? um, sort of thing. But yeah, if you are interested, um, in kind of being connected on a more regular basis, like please put your email in the chat. Um, we'll try to arrange our next meeting and try to get a plan to go forward with some of these things. And also, let's um, pull up the poll about connecting veterinary and animal law students. Um, do we think that's a good idea? This is something I am personally, oops, don't answer the untitled question. I'm pretty excited about, um, I would love the idea of fostering dialogue between these two groups, kind of building the future, imagine, the trust and the collaboration that could be built. You have these future attorneys connecting with future expert witnesses in court, um, future maybe even defendants if they're brave enough. Um, 
So that's, I, I just love this idea, but I think they need, it needs to be, there needs to be a reason for vet students and law students to come to these things is, are there exciting speakers that will be presenting? Um, how can we foster that, those relationships um, with these people? So I need some ideas about that. Who's willing to speak to these students? Who's willing to sort of be mentors to them? Yeah, Katie says there's so many types of veterinarians out there. Not all are good at the forefront activism part, but want to make a difference for animal welfare. Um, so I think it would be good to have resources for different ways veterinarians can help and make a difference using the skills that we already have. Yes, absolutely. Um, looks like everybody's pretty excited about this and are willing to help, so that's great. Um, and yeah, I all of the, the vets who aren't good at the forefront activism type, like they're the quiet types who are just fine with like, let me get a seat at the table. Like, let me be all professional and work my way up and get on the AVMA committees, get on the house of delegates, get in leadership roles where I can make a difference. Um, and then there's some people who are like very passionate and outspoken, like Dr. Casillo, who's not afraid to, to say what she thinks. And that's really powerful. Um, and then there are people who are really good at writing and really good at writing scientific papers. Um, so those writers are really good, whether it's scientific papers or just opinion pieces that would appear in, um, in regular media outlets is so important. Right now with avian influenza, here, I'll go to the next slide. So avian influenza is popping up um, again big outbreaks in South Dakota and Minnesota. And um, yeah, it, it's it's just devastating. And I would love to get opinion pieces in these local papers in South Dakota, in Minnesota. Um, there's the St. Louis for Dispatch, I think is a big one. Um, I'm going to submit um, for a piece to them, but we could really use some more and some letters to the editor just to raise awareness about this because this is a FOIA document that we just got in. This is from earlier this month, October 9th in Minnesota, which is one of the top three most prepared states as far as planning for emergency situations. They have stockpiled the equipment needed to use AVMA preferred methods. And you can see here, they are using ventilation shutdown to kill these birds. And it's not the state's fault. The company chose to use ventilation shutdown over using the state's um, stockpiled methods that they had. Why would they do that? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. Um, a lot of the companies are upset about the amount of water it uses to use something like foam. Um, they're also upset by how muddy it gets the barn. And so these, these large integrators, I don't know it, what integrators exactly was in this case, um, but they have purchased these large heaters to have on hand to stockpile so that they can use ventilation shutdown to kill their birds. And last, they blame last year, the reason that they used ventilation shutdown was because they ran out of CO2. And Italy, interestingly, had the same problem where Italy also ran out of CO2 and the Netherlands. But instead of re resorting to ventilation shutdown, they took liquid nitrogen, which is readily available. We use it regularly for artificial insemination to store semen. Um, and they put hoses into the barns and vaporize the liquid nitrogen into the barns, which caused the birds to be unconscious quite rapidly. 
um, very little suffering because they it just displaces the oxygen um, with nitrogen, they can exhale the carbon dioxide that builds up. So they don't have that suffocation feeling and they just pass out. So wonderful solution has been made in Italy and the Netherlands, and we are not adopting it here um, because we thought ventilation shutdown is good enough for, for our birds. They don't deserve anything better, I guess. Um, so yeah, and word on the street is the new draft of the guidelines on depopulation will be out in November and ventilation shutdown will stay in the guidelines. So that's concerning. It's just a draft though. I mean, there's still time, but it's not looking good. Um, so we just have to raise awareness about this, the horror of this. And I'm getting more documentation to prove. I mean, all of this is kind of stuff I've learned from conversations with people who are sources familiar with the situation. Um, but I don't have written documentation for any of this other than this spreadsheet, this thing. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, any other lawyers here? Um, Shady says, we work together with lawyers to reform or create laws that could be a sharing point. Yeah, like legislative change is super important. Um, as far as dealing with ventilation shutdown, what do we think about corporate pressure campaigns, getting these companies to sign a pledge that they won't use ventilation shutdown or trying to pass laws in each state that heat stroke can't be used as a form of killing. Uh, let's see. Oh, B has a hand raised, yes. Yeah, I thought it would be easier to talk rather than try to write it in the chat. Yeah. I guess, what, hi, Tom, Tamara, nice to see you here. Um, I guess one thing I would say, and this might be in the uh, category of a pep talk, I, I don't think you should sell yourself short. For one thing, veterinarians just generally are have a higher rating among the general public than attorneys do hmm. and i think that there are opportunities each profession can contribute something so i'm i'm going to give one example and this i don't want to get way too much in the weeds uh this is something that I mentioned to you, Crystal, at the conference. But one of the things that I think is important is to try to figure out how things work in the government and the agencies and where you can intervene. So I can talk a little bit about Michigan, and there are probably similar uh, systems in other states. And people are probably familiar with the acronym GAMPS, Generally Accepted Agriculture Management Practices, um, which are developed by industry insiders. And they're, they're, when those are being developed, because it's a public uh, body that's doing it, there's an opportunity to comment. There's also an opportunity for veterinarians to get themselves on these advisory boards that determine the, the GAMPs. And I can see, and this is just an example, there are probably other uh, projects out there, but I can see an attorney or law student, vet, vet student, submitting comments on, say, the GAMPs, which at least the current ones in Michigan, uh, on the 
animal, the care of, an, of farmed animals still doesn't, um, still allows for ventilation shutdown. So mm -hmm. you can see projects like that where it's something practical and useful that students can do. And the two uh, professions uh, each bring their own uh, their own expertise to it. So again, that's kind of a general comment, but I think that's something students like to oftentimes do actually do something. Yeah, um, I love it. I've seen, I was looking at Minnesota and like how, how they work um, and they have like their animal board and then they, they have the opportunity, like you can submit a rulemaking petition. To them. Um, I would love for more students and people in general to like look into these opportunities. Um, some people are always sending me various things I need to do and comment on. And I'm, I'm always like scrambling last minute to get in comments or like, oh, tonight I have to appear at this whatever city council meeting. And I quickly write up my comments and stuff, but um, it would be great to have more people kind of keeping an eye on all of these poss possibilities and a strategizing um, for this. Um, and also going to these ag conferences to, I, I learned so much by attending these things. And I know it can be really emotionally draining and hard to sit there and listen to, like I just listened for like hours on how to manage 100,000 dead bodies. Um, it's horrifying, but it's, they can't fault you for not understanding once you, you're like, I was there. And when you can educate producers about what they do more than even they know and teach them stuff about this whole process, um, I think you're really in a good position to advocate for the animals. Um, Cause I think a lot of people just don't realize what's possible um, and they don't see the dangerous road that they're headed down either. Um, they're just stuck in this one perspective for this. And it's, I think we get stuck in our habits and that's where our producers have gotten. So yeah, what can we do though? And I think we all need to, to get our heads together, get help the students out um, and make a plan um, for the future. Um, so I will, start having these regular meetings and maybe we can formulate a, some clear action items for people. Um, if you are at a vet school, no vet students, if you're a vet student, um, what clubs are you involved in? Can you arrange a lunch talk? Um, if you know student, ALDF student, chapter members or the leader of an ALDF student chapter, like get them in touch with me and we can sort of organize and strategize these things. Um, put on your Google alerts, everything about factory farming and avian influenza and sign up for, to get alerts for all of the ag conferences that are coming up. And if you don't know them, follow me on Twitter. Cause I'll always post them on my personal Twitter account. Um, so yeah, any other thoughts or ideas? I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, and yes, I approve of inviting Carter to our meetings. I don't know if he, he's very busy, but um, hopefully we can, use him in an impactful way. He would be great to speak in front of the vet students too. Um, making a Google survey for participants prior to meetings might be helpful. Um, yeah, what kind of survey? I'm wondering. Just for talking points. 
points. Yeah. Do you have any ideas for talking points? Um, um, I guess it's kind of hard because I think a lot of us come from different backgrounds and um, I think if we just all go into a meeting, it's kind of hard to like focus on the action items. And I think maybe if we all contributed what we thought was important, maybe you or someone could select out like the parts where we can all work together. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I know that's hard and I know it's a big job and yeah. it's complicated, <laughs> but yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, well, let's, what are my next poll questions here that I have? Oh, my thing isn't working. No. All right, any other thoughts while I figure this thing out? And to um, the next poll, I think will be about fundraising because in order to enact all of these plans and try to advance stuff for animals, um, we need to fundraise. Um, this takes a lot of time my own personal time I have I have made a cent from any of this and I'm happy to donate my time um but a lot of the stuff to keep our honor going to travel to conferences to travel to vet schools um does cost a lot of money um so in order to keep doing our work we need to to fundraise so do you have suggestions for how we can go about doing that I'd love to hear it. And the whole sponsorships, like I don't know if you've seen some or veterinary groups, they're like sponsored by Zoetis. I think of like the AVMA um, is classic. Um, let me see if I actually have, yeah, here's the all the AVMA is sponsors. <laughs> And I don't know if we should be sponsored by Beyond Meat or Upside or whatever. Um, but if Big Lentil, the Leguminati, if they want to sponsor us, should we do it? Let's see. We have some results from this. Yes. Donations, sponsorships, merchandise, paid continuing education events, and paid membership. Yeah, I, I've made all of our continuing education events free for everyone just because I was like, I'm so happy to just get this out there and get veterinarians to come and listen to CE from an animal rights perspective. But it does cost money to get race approval. It costs like $250. And then just the administrative time of all of that, of sending in, um, of applying for race approval, and then sending in all of the people who did the course so that they can get their credits. It takes a lot of time. So. Yeah, and a full day conference organized. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be awesome um, to have, you know how they have veterinary CE conferences at vet schools, like for various groups. If we had a conference, we didn't, I think we couldn't advertise it as an animal rights conference, but all, you know, race approved continuing education in person at a vet school, like really lend legitimacy to um, the cause and just normalize these ideas and debunk sort of the anti-animal rights stuff, propaganda that these vet schools are teaching with science. And if you do want to donate, there's our link to donate, ourhonor.org slash donate, so we can continue doing this work. 
um, it's much appreciated. And the last poll thing, let's do um, staying connected. How would you like to keep connected with our honor? Would you like to help us? Um, if so, how? Um, love to just kind of hear what your skills are and how you can join us. If you're able to volunteer your time, I know we're all very busy, but I really feel like we're making some important changes here. I feel like we're changing the conversation. And any other thoughts from anybody else here? Has any effort been made to reach out to John Sampan Matsu, the philosopher, for some kind of collaboration on matters of mutual interest? With Rollin and Reagan gone and Singer over the hill, he seems to now be the leading philosopher of animal rights, particularly with regards to food producing animals um, and compelling speaker and coming out with a new book in 2024 of food animals. That I, I know John and um, I have asked him to do a CE event with us and he hasn't gotten back to me, um, but I should bug him again. And yeah, especially with his book coming out. Um, and if you know John too, like, please get him. And there's also, um, oh my gosh, I'm blinking on his name, but the guy, the, the lab animal, um, researcher who wrote that article in Vox about mice. Um, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, but he's awesome too. And he's got a book coming out as well. So yay for the people who do want to volunteer. That's fantastic. Helping with social media, writing, um, organizing gatherings. That's super helpful since I'm not a super extroverted person. Um, text message, social media, email, cool group chat. We all like the WhatsApp. Cool. Well, and if you do, I don't know if any of those things are saved, but please send me an email um, with your information. And if you'd like to help out, there's my email address. Um, and we can get you connected. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, anybody else have anything? to say any other thoughts Let's see if i can get this i don't know fish feel but i'm down for more fish stuff we've got catalina lopez giving a fish welfare talk um but i love it like if she could do a ce event too. I think the whole race approved CE really normalizes this whole thing. Um, but also as a speaker for vet schools, um, for those like lunch talks, those student lunch talks would be really important. So get me connected. Yeah. If you know her. And yeah, these are the AVMA animal welfare principles that say the responsible use of animals for human purposes, such as companionship, food, fiber, recreation, work, education, exhibition, and research conducted for the benefit of both humans and animals is consistent with the veterinarian's oath. And I think we just need to get rid of that bullet point. <laughs> Why is that in the an animal welfare principles? I don't know. Um, 
but yeah, I won't take up too much more of your time. If anybody else has anything else to say, shoot. Otherwise, I'll let you all go. And thank you all for coming. And I will let you know when the next session is. Uh, maybe we'll do this once a week. I think it seems like an every Thursday thing if you guys are all down for that. Cool, good to see you all guys and I'll shut it down for now. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.